finished at this point where we uh, found out that for the LexMate application we need to use two different knowledge sources. The one is our database uh, coming from this uh, statistical survey in the year 1995 but this database is not representative um, because in this database there are only those patients which um, which took this, the surgery huh? and all the others those patients whom the doctor sends home immediately after the first exam examination these patients are not part of the database and therefore we cannot rely on this database as the only knowledge source huh? therefore we need some other knowledge source and the only thing we could find was literature and human experts huh? And we asked uh, Dr. Rampf, who is the chief surgeon at uh, 14 Nothelfer, and Dr. Hanschik. He is a physician in Frankfurt who uh, wrote his PhD thesis about appendicitis and a couple of publications and books and so on. Okay, and based on this knowledge, we uh, built such a hybrid architecture. Hybrid because we use machine learning techniques for acquiring knowledge from a database and we used explicit knowledge coming from human experts and the literature. And uh, using probabilistic calculus is in my opinion the best method for integrating knowledge from these two sources because there are nowadays many, many different machine learning techniques uh, which can uh, produce rules out of such a database and also it turned out during the project which was yeah, n not really surprising that the, the physicians they understand conditional probabilities uh, this is not surprising because during uh, the, the study uh, in medicine they learn their knowledge based on statistics of course huh? um, and uh, the semantics the basis for such conditional probabilities of course are frequencies statistics so it's quite natural to ask a human expert such a question at least it's natural to ask a question uh, uh, whether the answer is correct or not is a different question huh? and uh, we experienced uh, quite a couple of times that I mean you ask the doctor for maybe such a probability oh, I mean this this probability is easy here because the answer is something like 70 percent but if you put more conditions here um, for example, we take as a condition um, yeah, no, no, uh, just let put one condition but, uh, but here a couple of different variables like leukocytes bigger than 100 I mean actually this, this should not be 100 is it in the book 100 too? I, I guess it should be 10,000 okay so that should be 10,000 now if we take some other symptoms like leukocytes bigger than 10,000 and fever um, bigger than 39 um, or let's say fever greater than 38 uh, and uh, ultrasonic positive and some pain symptom and if you then ask the doctor then the doctor would say oh yes these are the typical symptoms for appendicitis so um, the probability must be uh, quite high huh? and he would say something like 60% but I'm pretty sure it would turn out 
that the probability is something like 4% or whatever. Huh? Because there are not so many patients which have exactly this combination of symptoms. Huh? So the doctor would say, okay, oh yes, uh, there is a high probability, but high probability can be 4%. Huh? Because the, the default, if the symptoms would all be independent, then the probability would be, um, um, let's say, 0.001%. Uh? And then 4% is very high uh, compared to uh, the independence assumption. So you have to be careful when the doctor says there, there is a high probability. That doesn't mean it has to be close to 1%. Okay, so much about knowledge acquisition problems. Now, here we have a more detailed uh, picture of the system architecture. Um, it's the same picture, just more details. So here we have the kernel of the system, uh, which is the, 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 pit, um, the pit system, which does the max end completion based on our rule set. This is the rule set containing all these conditional probabilities. Huh? And where do they come from? They come from the database via rule induction, just counting frequencies. Then we have the human experts and the literature, and we um, induce probabilistic rules too. And from the rule set, max end completion produces a probability distribution. And uh, I mean, as you know, we need a complete probability distribution. Otherwise, we are not able to answer all queries. And then there is this runtime system, which uh, gets a query with symptoms and uh, outputs a diagnosis. Uh, which is the answer for the query. Yeah? And yeah, and here you see there is some weighting based on a cost mat matrix. We will see this in a few minutes. Because, I mean, suppose our system only gives the probabilities back to the user, then maybe the user um, might have a problem interpreting these uh, probabilities. We will see an example. Okay, and, and I mean, this is some extra feature. Um, the doctor inside the system can store the patients he has examined in a patient database, and later on he may ask queries to the database, but that's just an ordinary database. Huh? And, and here we have a second database. This is the database of these 15,000 patients from 95. Uh, and this is the, the database of the, the, the real patients this doctor has examined. And of course, there is a user interface. OK, yeah. Now, some words about the probability distribution. We talked about this already yesterday. Um, how many combinations of symptoms are there possible? That's the question. And that's exactly the size of our joint distribution. Huh? Um, so we have um, 10 variables which are binary. Huh? And each binary variable multiplies the number of possible combinations by 2. So 2 to the power 10, which is 1024, times one variable has 10 values, and then these are all the other variables. Huh? And we have to multiply them all, and what we get is 20 millions and something. Huh? Um, and then, we, have, of course, we have to subtract 1 from this. This is the number of independent values. So in order to fill our multi-15 dimensional uh, joint distribution um, matrix, we would need to input 
20,600,000 values, which is incredible. It's impossible. And it doesn't make sense. Um, but if we put only less than the, the uh, uh, so something like 500 rules, I mean, 500 rules is nothing but 500 out of these 20 million values. No? Um, so we have incomplete knowledge. We do have incomplete knowledge um, and we need the max end mechanism that completes our knowledge base. Okay, yeah, we have seen examples. So probability statements look like this. Yeah? Um, and we also saw that if we don't know the exact value for such a probability, we can give <coughs> intervals. So instead of 0 0.09, we could say this probability is between 0 0.06 and 0 0.12. Okay, and now, yeah, the important question is, I mean, if we look at all these possible statements, that would be 20 million. Huh? Which ones out of these do we select? So, first, we of course start with the simpler uh, statements. And this is, for example, a simple statement. Why is it simple? Because it only involves two variables. Out of our 15 variables, here we only have two. Huh? Um, I mean, in order to get these 20 million, we would have to write down all conditional probabilities involving all 15 variables, and then we would be finished. Uh -huh. If we would write down only statements involving two variables, then we would have or will have something like around 500 uh, probability values. Um, of course, there are also uh, rules which only have one variable. These are the so-called priors. So the probability for appendix inflamed. Huh? We can just uh, get this from some statistics and write it down. They are of course important. Huh? These are the prior probabilities and you have seen we need them in order to apply the base formula, for example. Um, but if we only write down the prior probabilities, that wouldn't help us to build an expert system because, of course, we need the connection between our symptoms and our diagnosis variables. Huh? So we at least need um, rules with two variables. Okay, so now if we look at all rules with two variables, then the question is, do we really need them all or do we need only a part of them? And what we did in order to find, uh, to find this out, um, we did a correlation analysis. Huh? So we looked at all pairs of symptoms and diagnosis. So in this graph here in the middle, we have the diagnosis uh, with these four values. And now around here, we have all the symptoms, starting with the leukocyte value and so on. And now in between the diagnosis and the symptom, there is uh, such an, uh, an edge. And you see the thickness of these arrows here uh, is different. This is the, uh, the, the thickest. And you see a number here, 88, 55, 48. And these numbers, they represent the strength of 
statistical correlations between these pairs of variables. So LUCO7 has a stronger correlation to the diagnosis um, than, for example, urine 2. Uh, and they are already sorted, sorted by their correlation strength. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so what you see here is one of the first steps whenever you analyze a database with respect to machine learning, uh, so it's a good idea to do a correlation analysis. Huh? So use your diagnosis variable and compute the correlation between the diagnosis and all your symptoms. Okay, so we see we really need the leukocyte value and that's why we, of course, compute all these values. And I mean, of course, you see, this is not only one value. This is, if leukocytes has seven different values and our diagnosis has four different values, so this is actually four times seven, which is 28 values. Huh? So this rule gives us 28 probability values. Okay. And of course, we also use uh, the, this is the fever value, six valued. Uh, so this gives us six times four is 24 values. Um, and this is the guarding pain. This is the age. Yeah, and so on. And um, so I don't remember. At some point, we put a threshold and we just use these variables where the correlation is above the threshold. And now the question is, so, so that's how we found out all the rules with the diagnosis and one symptom. And now the question is, do we need rules with more than one symptom? Huh? And the answer is, yes, we do, but not so many. So what we did it, at the next step is we uh, calculated the, uh, not only pair correlations between two variables, we also calculated triple correlations uh, involving uh, three variables. Uh, and then we looked uh, at, the, at the strength of these triple correlations and, I mean, not at all triple correlations, because there are already many of them. We just looked at triple correlations involving the diagnosis variable and any two of the other variables. And now these green arrows here, or arcs here, uh, they represent the strength of triple correlations. Huh? And you see the strongest uh, triple correlation is this one here. This is the rebound tenderness and the tapping pain. I mean, these are both symptoms where the doctor uh, presses somewhere in the abdomen and uh, then uh, asks the patient whether it has a pain or not. Um, so this is not really surprising because actually these two variables uh, they are kind of redundant. Yeah? It's not bad to have redundant variables, but this correlation doesn't really help us. But a very interesting uh, triple correlation is this one here, between leukocytes and DH. That's what I told you last time, um, because, I mean, an, an ordinary patient, let's say with uh, th an age of uh, 30 years, has a, um, a healthy immune system where the leukocyte value increases as a reaction to an inflammation. But for in the in the little kids, uh, this does not really work, and uh, in uh, very old patients too. Huh? So there is a correlation between the age and the leukocyte value given appendicitis or given not appendicitis. Yeah. Um, and we really need to use rules 
involving the diagnosis, the age, and the leukocyte value. Because now we can say, okay, so uh, the, pro uh, the conditional probability for an increased leukocyte value if the patient has appendicitis is high if the age is between 5 and, I don't know, 65. If the age is below 5, then the probability for an increased leukocyte value given appendicitis is not very high, and with old patients too. So we really need uh, these uh, rules with three variables in such a case. So in order to describe such really particularly interesting um, uh, knowledge, we need to use uh, rules involving three variables. And maybe for some circumstances we even need rules involving more than three variables. But here we didn't use them. Okay, any questions about this independence graph? Oh, it's the, the dependency graph. Yes, that's actually true. Um, yeah, I mean, there are two terms. The one is dependency graph and the other is independence map. Okay. So now, I mean, yeah, let me repeat. Let's look at our rough picture. I mean, here I said, okay, that's quite easy. We just count frequencies on the database, and that's how we get the probabilities for these rules. So this is actually the easy step, just counting frequencies on the database. But what is the difficult step? What's difficult in getting these... Uh, these rules here. Yeah, the difficult step is what I just described. To find out which ones out of the 20 million rules do we need. Um, and this step, finding out which rules uh, to use, this step cannot be done fully automatically. But the other step, counting the frequencies, we can write an easy program. As soon as we know these left-hand sides of the rules, we can write a program that gives us uh, these statistical estimates here. But finding out which rules to use is not so easy. This goes with this dependency graph. And I mean, part of the dependency graph can also be done automatically. I mean, we can write a program that computes all pair correlations. That's easy. But then when we have all pair correlations, we have to adjust the threshold such that we say, okay, we use all with a correlation value greater than 6. Huh? This threshold has to be adapted manually. So this is at least one step that has to be done manually. And then we, we calculate all these triple correlations involving the diagnosis. And here again, we have to put a threshold and say, okay, we use all triple correlations above some value. Okay, yes. I mean, this is just uh, nothing, nothing really new. We use a priori rules. This is an a priori rule here. We use uh, rules with a single condition here. Um, and we, ru we use rules um, with two conditions. For example, here, inflamed appendix and pain in the second quadrant. Um, <coughs> yeah, so here we have pain in the second and pain in the fourth quadrant. Let me see, did we have a 
a correlation here. Yeah, second and fourth quadrant, they do have a correlation. Yeah, so that's the type of rules we used. Okay, and in the input file, it looks like, in the PIT input file, it looks like that. Yeah? Probability for LUCO between 0 and 6,000 given uh, diagnosis negative and, so this is an and, and age between 16 and 20, this probability is in that interval. Okay, yeah. And this is how we estimate the, the conditional probabilities, just by counting frequencies. Okay, and now, now we have to talk about risk management. Um, so once, or should we talk about how the PIT system works? Yeah, a few words. I mean, the kernel of the PIT system is a piece of non-trivial software. Um, so first you have to uh, consider that um, the number of internal variables is quite big. Um, you have seen these examples with two variables. We had a variable A and a variable B. And then for our max end optimization, we got four variables, P1 through P4. Huh? So now if, if we have 10 binary variables, we get 2 to the power 10 internal variables. Now, in, uh, a system, uh, in a system like Lexmid, we get, how many internal variables do we get? Twenty million six hundred thousand. So we do a nonlinear optimization in a space with more than twenty million dimensions. So that's really, that's quite big. And uh, so um, that would, if, if, if this would be done naively, that would cost uh, extremely much computational uh, time. It would be impossible, no chance. So there, there are, uh, inside this PIT system, there are really smart optimizations for this uh, optimization process. And this, uh, I already mentioned, it's uh, what we use is sequential quadratic programming um, and really advanced data structures. Advanced data structures for representing um, kind of this, the structure of this graph. So the structure of this graph represents the structure of our rules. Huh? So we really have to represent this graph in efficient data structures and then during this optimization um, uh, only a small part out of these 20 million variables are active. Okay. So now we do have a, a, a pretty good implementation of uh, this optimization process. Yes, and oh, uh, once again, sorry. Uh, what's very important for uh, uh, an efficient computation is that this graph is not fully connected. If this graph is fully connected, so that means um, we do have, I mean, here in this picture, we only have the, the blue edges, which are the pair correlations, and the green edges, each green edge actually corresponds to a, I don't know how we call this, um, an edge combining three nodes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's based on a triple correlation. 
and this green edge actually is the green and these two blue together so we have such a triple correlation and then we would even in the worst case need the, the, the four correlations and five correlations and so on and then we would have an extremely complex uh, structure so we have to use efficient data structures uh, for this and uh, smart implementation um, okay yeah but this this works and the pit system um, it takes less than one second to um, to give an answer to a query huh? so this is really efficient um, but now what the pit system outputs is this so we, we input the symptoms for a particular uh, patient and then after a short time you get four probability values. Let's look at this example. 24% for inflamed appendix, 16% perforated, 55% negative and 5% other diseases. What to do? What would you do with this patient? ask a doctor but suppose you are on some island somewhere and there is no doctor and no cell phone nothing just you and no just you and you huh? you're alone and you know you know, you, you and, and your laptop with the PIT system on it. Yeah? <laughs> what to do? So while you are thinking about what to do, let me tell you a story. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, medicine and appendicitis and uh, surgeries uh, when we talked to, to uh, Dr. Rampf in the clinic. And, uh, oh no, this, this, this story was from Dr. Honchik. Um, he told us that there was somewhere on an expedition a person and he was alone somewhere, I don't know where in the mountains, uh, I have no idea, but he was alone and, uh, and he, he was a physician and he got an inflamed appendix and he found out okay my appendix is inflamed and then he took the surgery so he really cut his abdomen and took the, the appendix out by full consciousness huh? so now the question is would you do that or not? I mean, the, the, I mean, there are two chances. The one is to, to do the surgery and the other is to die. Huh? If, you, if you have a, really have an inflamed appendix, then it's a matter of a couple of days and, and you would die. Okay, but now the question is, we have these four probability values. What to do? Shall we do the surgery or not? It depends on the risks. Okay. Yeah, so now tell me, what, what would you do? Yeah. Yes, so we, we have a 40% chance for a severe uh, illness. So huh? the risk is And we have a 60% chance for no inflamed appendix. Huh? But you're right, it depends on the risk. Huh? Um, but you see, I mean, if, if I wouldn't tell you it's about appendicitis, I just would uh, tell you, give you these probabilities, and I ask you, you have to decide for one of these four possibilities. Which one would you choose? 
Of course you would choose the one with the highest probability. Because you don't know about the costs for these four decisions. Huh? So we really have to consider the cost uh, involved with these four decisions. Huh? And that's what we did in LexMed. And that's actually a very nice feature of the architecture of LexMed. Let me go back to this picture with the architecture here. This is very important and really very nice in LexMed. I really like this because this, this box here, this is the probabilistic kernel of LexMed. Huh? And out comes this vector with probabilities. So inside here, in this probability distribution, there we have the medical knowledge. Huh? And out comes medical knowledge. And now this medical knowledge um, is being processed using this cost matrix and inside this cost matrix there we have the the risks there we have the 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 moral the ethics of the doctor yeah? um, I mean not all doctors would do the same thing uh, given these probabilities it depends it depends so if the doctor is really conservative and afraid of any risk, the doctor would of course say, uh, do, the, do the surgery. And the doctor would even do the surgery if we would have uh, 0.05 here and 0.01 here. Huh? Uh, and actually, if we go, let's say, 30 years back, which was in 1980, um, at that time, um, many patients um, have been uh, operated on uh, because at that time they said it's better to remove the appendix because even if the patient has no appendicitis but then he never will get appendicitis again huh? no matter whether he had it or not um, at that time, they, they did uh, way too many appendicitis surgeries huh? because they were afraid and conservative and maybe also interested in earning money, these uh, clinics. Huh? Okay, so the, the, the right thing to do here is to use the cost matrix, which is really simple and basic linear algebra and a little bit of statistics. Huh? So we use this probability vector and we just multiply it on this matrix. And then we get a result vector which is this. And we use this result vector and uh, look for the minimum in this vector which is here and that's our decision. Uh, stationary observation. That means we keep this patient in the clinic and uh, carefully watch him. <coughs> so now what happens inside this matrix? The numbers inside this matrix are the costs for misclassifications. Look, what we have here is the various uh, real diagnosis. So this patient may be inflamed, perforated, negative or other. But now the question is what to do with this patient and that's what we have here, the therapy. Operation, emergency operation, ambulant observation. I mean this is, <laughs> this is like uh, uh, a nice formulation of sent the patient home. Huh? Um, other diseases and stationary observation, that's, that means, so if we don't really know what to do, we just keep him in the clinic and watch him. Okay, and now look at the diagonal elements here in this matrix. They are all zero because if I take the 
right decision. For example, if the appendix is inflamed, then the right decision is operation. So if I do this operation in this case, then there are no costs for misclassification. Huh? If I do the emergency operation in case of a perforated appendix, then there are no costs for misclassifications, and here too. And, but what you see here is, this is not a square matrix. We added this extra line for these cases where we don't really know what to do. Huh? Um, and now we have to fill this matrix with values. Um, for example, this value here. If the appendix is inflamed and we send the patient home, then um, we get high costs for misclassification because with high probability uh, this patient may in the worst case die or the, the appendix may, be, may get uh, perforated which is uh, much worse and much higher risk than inflamed appendix and the patient may come back to some other clinic and need uh, emergency operation. So this is quite expensive. Even more expensive is it if the doctor sends a perforated appendix home. Huh? Um, this costs 150,000 euro. Huh? So now, uh, or let's look at some other uh, error. For example, if the patient is negative, that means the patient is healthy, and we do the appendix operation, then this costs 5,800 euros. Where does this come from? I mean, this is just the cost. First, the cost for the operation, and second, the risk uh, for the patient. I mean, the, the highest risk in such simple operations is the um, anesthesia, narcosis. Uh, uh, so one out of 2,000 patients dies just from anesthesia. Uh, and uh, the cost for human life is uh, about 3 million euro. Uh, how can we find this out? We just ask insurance companies. Uh, um, and now we multiply these uh, 3 million by uh, 1 over 2,000 and then we get something like, something like uh, 1,000. Huh? So the cost for the operation is 5,000 plus 800 for the anesthesia risk. Okay, and this is, this is quite similar. I mean, we have, uh, if we send the perforated appendix home, there is a high chance for this person to die. Huh? Uh, and now we take three million for the life, um, and now and and multiply it by uh, by one over twenty, we get one hundred fifty thousand. So that looks like uh, um, one out of twenty patients that one out of 20 perforated appendix patients that the doctor sends home will die. Huh? Because all the others, they go to some different clinic and they finally will have the surgery and will be happy at the end. So that's how we roughly calculated these numbers. And it turned out when we examined this matrix that it's not really important whether we have 150,000 here or 200,000. That's not important. What's important is the relation between this and this. Of course, this has to be much higher than this guy. I mean, in the, in the LexMate project, we, we did some work in finding out these numbers, but not too much. So if such a system would be in really in everyday use, then, of course, some more effort has to be put into these numbers. But this is quite interesting. And, and when I gave talks for the health insurance companies, I mean, we were trying to raise money to continue this project. Uh, and whenever I talked to health insurance persons, this was the most interesting part of my talk. Huh? Because it was about money. Huh? 
And they immediately saw that such a cost matrix could help them save a lot of money. Huh? Because finally, these numbers here are the average costs, the expected costs for such a patient. So look, now what, what did we do? Let's take this patient with these probabilities. And suppose we do the operation on this patient. Then, with 25%, we have no cost. With 50%, we have 500. With 55, we have this. And with 5%, this. So the expected cost for this patient is the weighted sum of these numbers, which is 3,565. And the same uh, for all the other decisions. So we just multiply this vector with all the rows in this matrix and we get this new vector and of course we decide for the row with the smallest value which is stationary observation here. Huh? Yeah. And I mean we, we can see even more from this vector we can also see that almost the same value is here with other diseases. So maybe it's, it would be a good idea to send this patient to some other department. So if it's a woman, maybe <coughs> to the uh, gynecologist uh, just, uh, to examine her or whatever. But we, we, and we can also see that it would be a very bad idea to send this patient home because that would, be, would involve quite high expected costs. Huh? Okay. Yeah, and now the, the, the health insurance companies, they are so interested in this because at the end of the year when the data of all the patients are stored, they could multiply all the patients in this clinic with this matrix and get out of them the expected costs. Huh? And then they could uh, compare the expected cost um, for this patient with the real cost of this uh, clinic and then they could say, okay, this clinic was more expensive than what Lexmate would have done with all these patients. Of course, we, we also have to use Lexmate to, com to compute uh, these probabilities. Huh? So they, they immediately saw that Lexmate might be, for the future, kind of a standard. Huh? Whenever a clinic is worse than Lexmate, uh, they will force the clinic to use Lexmate for the diagnosis because it would be better. Huh? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And finally, so when we use Lexmate to com or PIT to compute the probabilities and then the cost matrix, we have a, a cost oriented agent. Huh? Okay, yeah. And now um, let's look at a simplified version of Lexmate. So what we had here was um, four different diagnosis cases, inflamed, perforated, other and negative. And now we look at the binary case. Yeah? So the binary case means appendicitis or not just these two um, possibilities. NSAP stands for non-specific abdominal pain. Uh, that's what, I mean, all the patients that come into the clinic um, with the question appendicitis or not, they do have pain in the abdomen. Uh, and so those who, the, whom the doctor sends home are the NSAP patients, non-specific abdominal pain. Okay, and we have two, two therapies, the operation or sending them home. 
So P1 is the probability for operation, and P2 is the, pro the probability for sending them home. These two probabilities will be calculated by PIT. Huh? And then these two probabilities will be multiplied with the cost matrix. And the cost matrix is such a matrix with zeros in the diagonal and two values K1 and K2 of diagonal. Huh? And now if we multiply this vector with this matrix, we get just this weighted sum. We get K2 times P2 and K K1 times P1. Huh? Okay. And now if we multiply this vector by 1 over K1, we get K2 over K1 times P2 and P1. So what, what we can see from this is the only thing that matters is the ratio between these two numbers, K2 and K1. That's what it, what's important. Huh? That's what really has an influence on our decision. Okay, so we could, I mean, we, uh, the, uh, what we did here is we could have done it here. And then the matrix would be, how would the matrix then look like? It would be 0, 0, and uh, 1, and K2 over K1. And we could write this like 0, K1, 0. And now you see that this, uh, this matrix has one free uh, uh, variable, which is K. Uh, so we can adjust this value K between 0 and infinity, and this gives, finally, the ethics of this doctor. Huh? Um, yeah. So if this doctor is extremely careful, then K may be zero or infinity, or if it's a really brave doctor who is not afraid of anything, it's just the other extreme. Huh? Okay, and if k is equal to 1, then there is no preference for either decision. No? Okay, what's important here is there is one parameter. So if we take a binary decision, there is this one parameter k uh, which contains the moral of this doctor. No? So there is no, I mean, there is no magic. Sometimes people say, okay, this is an ethical thing and only humans can do this. This is not true. I mean, it's just mathematics. Of course, this mathematics is implemented in our brain, but it's just mathematics. Okay. Yeah, okay, so for k equals zero, we have an extremely risky system and k towards infinity all patients are operated. Huh? That's the conservative extreme. Okay, and now what we did is we, we, we run our LexNet system in, in the binary case. Huh? And then we varied this parameter k. Huh? We varied this parameter k and so that's um, variation of this parameter k gives us the working point of the system. And if you look at these curves, the many points on such a curve, so which one? This is Lexmate, the black points here. Yeah, so we have, this is the, the region from k equals zero to k equal infinity along this curve. But now, what are these curves here in this diagram? We have drawn here the sensitivity and one minus the specificity. So unfortunately, uh, I'm missing this on the slide, so I write the definition. The sensitivity is equal to 
Um, what is it? The true positive, let me look it up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's equal to the number of patients which are positive, are really positive, and um, classified as positive. Divided by the real, real positive, yes divided by the number of positive patients. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, so among all patients that do have appendicitis, how many of these do really ha uh, have been classified as positive by Lexmate, for example? Uh? So out of the appendicitis patients, how many have been recognized? Uh, that's the sensitivity. And uh, I mean, yeah, we could uh, extend this. The sensitivity is equal to the conditional probability P of um, classified positive given positive. Yeah. It's this conditional probability. That's the sensitivity. And it makes sense to call this sensitivity. Huh? Okay, so here we have the sensitivity and here we have 1 minus the specificity. So what is the specificity? Is equal to P of classified negative given negative which is the number of negative patients and classified negative divided by negative. So out of the, so now we look at all the patients who have no disease. And how many out of these have been classified correctly? Okay? So now you know what we want. What do we want? We want to have this probability equal 1 and this probability equal to 1, 2. That would be our perfect doctor. Huh? Because such a doctor would, would find all appendicitis, appendicitis patients and this doctor would also send all healthy patients home. Okay, and now in this diagram which is called the ROC curve. ROC st stands for Receiver Operating Curve. Don't ask me why, where this comes from. Um, and they draw not the specificity, they do 1 minus specificity. Don't ask me why. Huh? So 1 minus this is 1 minus this. So we, here on this axis we want to have a 0. Huh? And on this axis we want to have a 1. Uh, okay, so our goal is to end up at this point. This is where we would like to have our doctor or our expert system. Okay. And now let's first look at this diagonal here. This diagonal would be a quite simple expert system where, yeah, actually look at this point. At this point, right in the middle, we have 0.5 here and 0.5 here. That would be a system where the, there comes the patient and then you input the symptoms and then it would just toss a coin. 
And if it comes out heads up, operation, otherwise send him home. With probability 0.5, you either send him home or you do the operation. That would be this system. Okay, so now you, you might say, oh, but that's, that's not good. That's too risky. Why don't we operate everybody? Huh? That would be a sensitivity of one. So that would be this extreme point. This point would be operation on all patients. We just don't look at the patients. We cut them all open. Huh? That would be this point. And this extremely risky point here would be send them all home. And then, of course, we could uh, do with a probability of 10% send them home and 90%. No, th that would be send home with 90% and operation with 10%. Okay, so that's very important to see this uh, straight line here. This straight line is the extremely silly expert system that just causes a toy. Tosses a coin. Yeah? Uh, so we don't, uh, this is, this is the, the, the worst case. You can't be more thumped than this. If you go down here, for example, at this point, this is actually very, very good. Uh, just with the problem that we do, all, we always take the inverse decision. Huh? But inverting some intelligent behavior is intelligent either. Huh? Okay, so what we want is, we want to have a line which is far away from here, which would be actually here at this point. Yeah. So we take our LexMed system and then multiply the probability vectors with this matrix for different k. Yeah? And that's what we get with our LexMed system. It's this curve, which is yeah, pretty high up here. And now we compare it with the Oman score. I told you what's the score. The score is such a linear weighting function with a threshold based on our symptoms. And that's the Oman score. And what you can see, except this point, LexMed is much better than the Oman score. Huh? Even so, we have to know that this guy, Oman, uh, he used a perfect representative database. So his database, uh, the, the, his score is produced by logistic regression from a database. And his database was representative, so it was much better than our database. Um, and the inter interesting result is even with the not representative database, the LexMate performance is much better than uh, what Oman did. Yeah? I mean, the, the, the working point of such a system, I guess it would be around here in this area. And here you can see that LexMate is much better uh, than the Oman score. Maybe it even would be in this region. I mean, of course, we would go from, from this diagonal more to the right because it's uh, towards the conservative direction. Huh? So we rather do more surgeries than too few. Huh? So the working point would be somewhere in this area and here LexMate is much better than the, Om the Omai score. And now, yeah, and in order to see how much better LexMate is than the Omai score is if we do the same thing that Oman did on our LexMate data, then we get one of these two curves. So we produce a score with the LexMate data with the same mechanism. That's the curve we get. Huh? So this is, this is a measure for how much 
um, the Oman data have been better than our data. And even with these much worse data, uh, LexMate produced such a good performance. Yeah. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah, okay, so now let's finally talk about applications of FlexMate, which is maybe quite interesting too. Um, of course, LexMate can be used in, in everyday diagnosis in any clinic. Um, it can also be used for quality assurance. I already talked about this. The health insurance companies would be interested. And it is actually in, uh, oh, let's say it was in everyday use since 1999 in the Fürze Nothelfer clinic. So now since about half a year, Professor um, Dr. Rampf uh, retired. So he is no more in the clinic and I don't know what they do with LexMate. I guess they don't use it anymore. Um, but it, it, uh, it is still available on the LexMate uh, website. Yesterday we saw it didn't work, so we have to look what's, what's up. I guess the database crashed again, so we have to reboot the database. Um, the diagnosis quality is comparable to an, to an experienced surgeon. Huh? Um, that's what we, what we really proved and we published this result also. Um, but the problem is it doesn't sell. We really tried, we gave talks to the insurance companies, to doctors and so on. I gave a talk for the Landesärztekammer uh, in Stuttgart um, and there were around 30 uh, physicians and most of them are really well-known professors from the big uh, university clinics in Baden-Württemberg. And uh, I mean, they, they, they really liked uh, the presentation and the LexMe system and they were really happy about it and we had some discussion which was quite interesting and they said, okay, yes, this has to be uh, installed and has to be sold and so on. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, in, in this talk there was no decision. And uh, then I, uh, I went back home and, um, yeah, I don't know, a few weeks later, I uh, asked the Landesärztekammer now what's going on and there, there was no answer. No answer at all to my email. Then I wrote a letter, no answer again. I took a couple of phone calls. Finally, it turned out nothing. No? Nothing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then I don't, I don't remember what was the, uh, the event. At some point, I got a letter from the Landesärztekammer where they asked me never to mention them in the LexMate conce uh, conte uh, context again. Huh? Uh, they, they, they threatened me, uh, threatened to sue me uh, if I would mention them again. So n just tell them and they will sue me. Huh? Um, and uh, why? Why did they do this? Because this is one of the extremest conservative organizations you can imagine. They, they are actually afraid that the doctors lose their jobs because of LexMate. Huh? A similar thing happened, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago when the uh, CAD systems for the mechanical engineers were invented. Then some conservative mechanical engineers were afraid that all mechanical engineers would lose their jobs. That's what happens now in medicine. Huh? I mean, it was, okay, it was uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, but still, I mean, nobody comes to me and asks me, oh, you, you invented this LexMate system. We would, we would like to use it. No, nothing. Huh? 
And uh, I mean, many clinics could save a lot of money if they would use such a system. We have proven this. We have proven this. The quality of LexMed is as good as an experienced surgeon. And you can be sure that in all clinics during the night, there are not always the experienced surgeons who examine the, the patients that come during the night or in some emergency room and so on. Huh? Or, or uh, the, the ordinary uh, physicians. I mean, you wouldn't go to the clinic when you have some pain in the abdomen. You just uh, visit your, your ordinary doctor. These doctors, they don't see so many appendicitis patients, so they are, they are far worse than the experienced surgeons. If they would use LexMed, they wouldn't send so many patients to the clinic and they wouldn't send so many patients home. Um, so it, w it would be a real gain, but the German medical system is not prepared for this. Huh? There is no market, that's the point. There is no market in the German medical system and that's why such a, a system uh, still is lying around on the shelf and it doesn't sell. It's the wrong time. I mean, this is, this is nothing new. Uh, many, many great inventions um, were already present uh, 20 years earlier, but it was the wrong time and uh, so the, the world was not ripe to, for this invention and that's the same thing. And actually, we are not the first to invent Lexmi. I told you that the Dombal in Great Britain in 1972 developed an expert system for acute abdominal pain. When I saw this in the literature, I immediately asked me, why didn't he sell his system? Now I know it. I mean, 30 years later, we don't sell it either. Maybe we need 30 more years and then people come and say, okay, we need LexMed. That's quite interesting. Uh, another example, when I came here to this Fachhochschule in 1994, which is 17 years ago now, um, I came back from Munich to Oberschwaben and I immediately saw that all the mechanical engineering companies here, like Müller Weingarten, MTU, Feuzulzer, ZF, and so on, they all would need our AI technology. They, they need machine learning to optimize their, their machines and motors and engines and so on. And I, I tried to contact them, ZF and MTU and Müller Weingarten and so on and Feuzulza, all of them. I contacted all of them. They didn't understand me. I tried to explain them what's going on here, what technologies we do have. They didn't want to understand me. They just ignored it. No chance, no chance. And you know what? Now, in 2011, this year, five mechanical engineering companies contacted me and asked for my machine learning techniques. It is ZF, MTU, Festo, um, Schellinger, it's a small company in Weingarten, and uh, now Schunk, which is actually a, a robotics company. Um, that's, that's kind of funny. They all come in 2011. And I tell you why. Because over the media they learned that AI makes sense. Yeah? There is AI now um, is in the commercial markets. I mean, you just have to look at Google and Amazon. They really use machine learning techniques to improve the performance of their systems. And even the mechanical engineers, they have read in the newspapers or in TV, they have seen that this is quite good. So now they got the idea maybe it would help us too. I don't know how long it would take for medicine to wake up. But you can be sure we lose a lot of money uh, for this reason and we do have a lot of patients that die 
because the doctor did not use Lexmed. That's for sure, absolutely. We had an example here at the Fachhochschule. This was actually in, I think it was in 99 or 2000, when, when Lexmed was already online. Huh? One of our assistants, I mean, he was a predecessor of Mr. Bernhard over in the T building. He had, uh, he had um, abdominal pain. He visited his doctor on, in the middle of the week, I guess it was on Wednesday. He went to the doctor, examination. Doctor said, okay, this is acute abdominal pain. Go home, don't worry. You drink some, uh, uh, some tea and everything is okay. The next day on, on Thursday, he went back to the doctor because the pain was worse. Doctor examined him again and said, go home, it's nothing. On Friday, it, uh, his pain, pain became extremely worse, on Friday, uh, bad on Friday evening. Fortunately, his doctor was already closed. So he went to the clinic on Friday evening, and at that point, the appendix was already perforated. So he, uh, he then, then they took the emergency operation, and he finally survived. But a perforated appendix is no fun at all. Huh? And I mean, if this doctor would have used Lexmid afterwards, when I, when I heard this, we input his symptoms. We did not know the real symptoms. We did not know the leukocyte value and so on. We just input his fever value and that he had the pain in the right lower. And then even without the leukocyte value, Lexmid would have uh, kept him in the clinic and observed him stationary. Huh? Okay, but that's how it works. I mean, I gave a couple of talks and it's not my business to travel all over the world for many years and, and uh, try to convince the health, health insurance companies. We even went to the Medica, which is the biggest uh, medis medical fair in Düsseldorf every year. Um, yeah. And we talked to we talked to managers from uh, medicine and they said, oh yeah, that makes sense, but it wouldn't sell now. That's what they told us, and they knew it. Okay, yeah, so that's about Lexmate. Um, yeah, now let's enter this next uh, section, which is uh, very much related to uh, the Maxent method we used already. And that's reasoning with Bayesian network. So in an ordinary AI class, the professor typically would start the probabilistic reasoning chapter with Bayesian networks. I did it differently because Maxent is the much better method. Actually, Bayesian networks are a special case of Maxent where we have some independence assumption. Huh? Okay, yeah, so we are talking about random variables. Uh, we have d variables with n values each, um, and the probability uh, distribution then, of course, has n to the power d minus 1 values. Um, yeah. And what's, what's very important, we have already seen this in the Lexmate case. Um, we don't want to specify all n to the power d minus 1 values. In Lexmate, that would have been 20 million. Huh? So we really have to exploit redundancies among the, the variables. Yeah? Um, and uh, therefore it's very important to, um, to treat all these variables that are independent as independent variables. Otherwise we get an extreme overfitting effect. We will see later. Okay, what, is an, what are independent variables? So these variables x1 through xd are independent if the, the joint probability is the same as the product of the priors. Huh? This is the definition of independence of these d variables. Huh? Um, and now if the variables are independent, if two variables are independent, 
then the conditional probability p of a given b which is defined as this and then if this joint probability is equal to the product then you can see the p of b cancels out and p of a given b is p of a. I mean this is a does not depend on b obviously. This is conditional, uh, no, no, not conditional. This is independence of two variables. Okay, and now let's start with an example. This example was invented by Udea Pearl. Udea Pearl is one of the big AI pioneers. We all already know his name from what? From heuristics. He wrote one book called Heuristics and one book uh, on probabilistic reasoning. Um, okay, this is an alarm example. So suppose, I guess it was it was Udea Pearl, who lived in Los Angeles, um, alone in his home. So you you have this nice little house somewhere in the hills above Los Angeles, um, and this is an earthquake area. Huh? And also this is an area where there are these rich Americans but there are black people who don't have money and there are all these Mexicans who have nothing at all. They have these really bad jobs and earn no money. So maybe they would, might be interested to break into Pearl's house and steal something out of his house. So maybe he wants to have an alarm in his house. Huh? Um, and then uh, Pearl designed such a Bayesian network to tell him whether there is an alarm or not. In, uh, no, no. What he wants to know, actually, he doesn't want to know whether there is an alarm. He finally wants to know whether there was a burglary in his house or not. That's what he wants to know. Okay. And he has an alarm in his house. And there may be, there are two possible reasons for the alarm. One reason is earthquake and the other reason is burglary. And, uh, and then he has to go to work to his university which is far from the house. So at the university he is not able to hear the alarm. And this is some many years ago where they didn't have the cell phone and uh, internet and so on. Uh, but he had two neighbors, two old people, and you know these old guys, what are they doing all the day? They are just looking out of the window and then these guys, they would of course hear the alarm going off at his house. Huh? And there was John, one of the neighbors, and Mary, another neighbor. Huh? And these neighbors, they, they would watch his alarm. And he gave these two guys his phone number at the office and whenever they hear the alarm at his house, they would call him. Huh? And now the question is, what could he conclude from Mary calling him at the office and telling him, oh, there is a burglar in your house? What, we, what could he conclude from John calling him? And what could he, could he conclude from both of them calling him? Huh? That's the question. So, and what he, what he did was, um, he measured some probabilities or maybe he knew them, uh, don't ask me where he got it from. The probability for John calling given alarm, which is 90%, this is something like the sensitivity of uh, John. Huh? So the, the, the sensitivity for John recognizing the alarm. So in 90% of the alarm cases John would call, but Mary would only call in 70% of all alarm cases. And, and then we, we need to know uh, probability for John calling given not alarm. This is important too. I mean, uh, John might call all the time. Huh? Uh, but this is only 5%, which is not too bad. But uh, in, in this respect, Mary is even better. So there are only 1% false alarms uh, or false alarm calls by Mary. Yeah? 
Okay, so these are the, these conditional probabilities, and then he also know, he knows has some knowledge about the alarm in his house. We need to know, for example, the probability for alarm given a burglary and an earthquake. That's 95 percent. Okay. Now, given burglary and no earthquake, we have 94 percent. No burglary and earthquake, 29 percent. I mean, that's, that's of course important that the probability for uh, in case burglary and not earthquake is much higher than not burglary and earthquake, which is 29%. And an alarm if no burglary and no earthquake is um, 1 over 1,000. Huh? Okay, and then we need the a priori probabilities. The probability for a burglary is 1 over 1,000, and the probability for an earthquake is 2 over 1,000. And then, of course, he wants to know um, something. I mean, that might be interesting. The probability for a burglary given that John calls or Mary calls. That might be interesting. So that's what we want to know from this knowledge. Huh? And now, um, this uh, will be modeled in such a Bayesian network where we have as the nodes our variables, burglary, earthquake. These are the, if we compare it to Lexmate, these are the, um, actually the, the diseases. That's what we want to know. We want to know whether there was a burglary. Huh? And we have these symptoms. These are the symptoms, John calling or Mary calling. And then there is this hidden variable. Of course, this alarm really sounds, but to, to Pearl in his office, this alarm variable is hidden. He has no idea about the alarm. So these are the symptom variables, and that's what he wants to know. Huh? Okay, but we will continue at this point next time. Thank you.